I think the, the big thing from me at this point is that there is no golden nugget. There is no magic answer for that big question. Making tiering decisions, it's probably the trickiest item of our job that causes sleepless nights, thoughts, am I doing the right thing? All of those kind of processes in your head. So it's very much a case study um, angle that we're coming at from today. And not a one-off case study. This has been building and supporting and, and, and in conversation since the new GCSE landed. So very much a case study of team decisions with ideas and support for those last minute decisions. And let's face it, we are talking about probably being in that period of time right now for the uh, the last minute decisions and I've put there that it's it is a case study it's it's our story mine and Mal's over several years so since 2015 now with that decision building up to today in one two three four five different schools that we've been in over those periods as teachers. I think it is important so five six years ago I was involved in a school where I went in in the January and we were faced with 61 kids, 51, 61 kids, I think it was, that we genuinely didn't have a Scooby-Doo about which tier of entry. And then when we left, because we both left it within that same school within the last 12 months, the school was in the position where those decisions, there was nobody that we were at this point trying to even consider it because we'd got students on the right pathway very early on. Um, so that's what we're, we're talking about here. I think just to reiterate, if people are looking for the answer and I'm going to be the voice of doom and gloom or the voice of sense, if you're looking for an answer, right, it's as simple as you give them this test. If they score that, you put them on higher. If you don't, they don't score. It isn't that cut and dried. And I know some people say that if they get a certain grade or a certain score on a certain paper at a certain point of time, that's what that their decision is. We're not taking away from what some schools use or some other case study ideas are that are out there but ours is very much a bigger picture with lots of elements that come in together and also taking every student as more of an individual uh, and giving them the chance to show what they're made of or show what they're better at show what they're more comfortable with and hopefully with our timeline idea that we've come up with over like i said over several years and what mal said then back in back in 2015 2016 that we, we can give you a bit of a glimmer and um, insight to what we've done he dates for you there just the summer dates for the gcse maths always worth knowing um what the the reality is that we're working towards here um and we've also got the gcse statistics exam dates we're going to be very much adding on anecdotally the the tiering idea with statistics. Very much broad uh, conversation is more about the GCSE maths. GCSE stats very much depends on the scenario within the school that is taking the stats. There's so many different case studies out there for it being at the end of year 11, end of year 10. As a, uh, a booster, some students being removed or taken out of other subjects to help the pot of the school. So there's so many different scenarios for stats. So very much every now and again, we're going to pipe up with uh, ideas for stats. But the like I said, the broad strokes here is, is generally about the GCSE maths that we're building to all AM exams. So the week before half term, then you've got the May half term and then the following week and the following week after. So I, when we were looking at this, I... Um... I think it is important we we because there's a big thing that was going around about how what percentage of your cohort was higher what was foundation it d genuinely does depend on your context but I pulled together here a picture from 2022 and 23 of the top line is all the candidates and then the bottom line of data show is just year 11 and I think that's fundamental to get your head around so we're talking about of all candidates, 54% will do the foundation, whilst 44, 45% will do the foundation of year 11 in GCSE. So be mindful of making tiering decisions based on talking to colleagues. It does depend on your context. And similarly with stats, we can see that the stats entries went up or the foundation entries went up to 45%, up from 40 but that's come with it, a fact that there's been a sort of 3,000 increase in entries anyway. So stats is a grower. 
but there is with stats there was very little difference between all candidates and year 11 candidates so GCSE is different and I think the point from that is just be mindful of everybody's school is different everybody's kids are different and it so much does depend on context and then with stats like Sega said it, it's for me it's relatively easy we cut this off at the knees um it depends why you're using the qualification ideally we want kids to know more maths whether it's statistics or GCSE and the ideal would be we teach every kid all of the higher tier content but it genuinely does depend on why you're using the qualification if you've got it as um extracurricular whether it's a option subject um, and there's some interesting statistics about students doing the higher tier, whether you're doing it to get them a grade. So if we look at some of the entry statistics for students that did GCSE, some people say, well, look, put them in on stats and they, at least they'll get a grade over the over a GCSE um, if they don't get it in math GCSE. The stats would not support that. If they're going to get a U, they're likely to get a U. So it's just interesting to think about why you're using this, the qualification. I think it's brilliant. So brings us back to how do we go about it? It's a three-year plan. And before we talk about what specific strategies or tactics we use, part of the fundamental part for us was about getting students to, all students to, have a, by the end of a certain point, we tell, our schemes of work have always been based on that we're all students get taught the foundation content first and then they go on to the higher content if they go on to higher. Rather than it being two lanes in a motorway where you've got a foundation route and you've got a higher tier route where those higher tier routes back in year nine might be getting taught some higher tier content, higher only content. But we've worked on the basis that all students access the, the foundation content and then they go on either to continue to study in, in more depth or they will go on and do the higher tier. For us, it's very much run in this way. So we're talking about your low attainers, your middle attainers, and your high attainers. And um, that's what the has, the mars, and the las mean. And I'm not talking about doing more key stage three. I'm talking about students, that by the crossover, we talk about it's the underlined content. So very early on, we want students to have accessed everything they would need to know for the foundation tier. And it is, it, again, it does depend on whether, you, so if we look at the route, it's probably the best thing to do. So we look at the route for your low attainers, they would come in in year nine, having done seven and eight, which might be mixed attainment, might be whatever you do. And we have done this over two years as well as three years. And we put a little scheme of work together where it's just the, the numeracy, everything we wish kids would know before they started the GCSE, with a view that they then start I'm not talking about going back and going, oh, let's all put these numbers in order. That's almost numeracy rather than the crossover. And they would then spend their whole time doing all the foundation tier content. Then we've got our middle attainers. We would spend time doing the crossover content with a view that some of those will go on and move to higher. Some will stay on the crossover till the end of year 11. We've always been in context where we know we have to get more people on the higher tier anyway, based on our entries. So it has been very much a strategy because some of them, some of the schools have been high prior attainment schools. And we know we need to very early on plant that seed. And then we've got our high attainers where we cover all the foundation tier content with a view to then spending the rest of their time doing the higher tier content if that makes sense. Happy to do another session looking at schemes of work in depth, but that's always our principle. And that underlies, underpins everything that we're going to talk about in terms of uh, the other strategies we use. It is condensed um, and you're hoping that a lot of the skills are just revision, that, or a lot of the lessons will be revision because they've, they've had more time to focus on it in key stage three. And I think one of the things we have to sometimes accept is a lot of the GCST is key stage three content, especially at foundation. So just trying to make sure that um, it's embedded. So that's underpinning everything that else we and Sega will talk about in more detail here. So the case study timeline here 
has got elements of what we have got. So talking about scheme of work and like Mal just said then, that, that's a whole difference. It could be a whole other conversation. We could spend another hour or so just looking at the schemes of work. What this case study timeline looks at is a broader view of the big things that can happen along the way. So we don't look at schemes of work here. This is like Mal said, your scheme of work is underpinning and almost ticking along behind the scenes and more conversation about that, just please get in touch. But this is your bolt-ons. These are the things to be thinking about, to be running alongside. Now, I've put year nine, year 10, year 11, and I'm gonna, when we go into detail about each year in a second, year nine-ish, because I know that a lot of people out there have two-year schemes, three-year schemes, five-year schemes, 11-year schemes, whatever it happens to be, what we're talking about here, is what the support is, what happens, and what you're thinking about is over three years. That's the big message. So yeah. if we, um, we'll keep coming back to that slide. So don't think you've got to look at all of what's written there. We're going to keep popping back to it and look at certain parts. So we're going to delve into first year nine and what can be thought about, what can be looked at. And then once we've done year nine, year 10, year 11, we'll look at the last minute conversations about what we could be thinking about now. And I know there's going to be lots of new heads of departments out there that are going through this for the first time, new teams, new assistant heads, new leadership teams that want to have an idea for this year. And I know I'm talking to a school at the moment that have got not a knee jerk response to this year. It's lots of factors have caused this year to be what, what do we do at this point? And my message was, let's sort, let's get a bit of an idea and a plan for this year, but we need to be thinking what we're doing with years nine and 10 to build them so we don't have that problem next year. In the yeah. Year. And I think that's the part, the reason I wanted to share the scheme of work is to say that it was a three-year plan at wherever we've been to move people more to the higher tier or to maintain yeah. the, the percentages there. And that it's never, obviously there's always that, what do I do about tiering decisions last minute? But this is about, it, we have to be a bit more strategic than it, every year dealing with those last minute decisions. Absolutely. The bits that are highlighted in blue is anything that's on the Edexcel Emporium. We'll, at the end of this, just quickly signpost how to get to those. And you've got the pink at the bottom, Script Viewer Results Plus, which we'll also delve into at the end. But everything else is just part and parcel of, and it has taken a, a long time to get this together because a lot of it happens with us without even thinking about it anymore. It's what do we do at certain points over those two to three years um, in terms of resources, ideas. So year nine-ish, and I've put year nine-ish because it doesn't necessarily have to be rubber stamped into year nine. The, these ideas here overlap into all of them, but this is where you want to be thinking about them. So first and foremost, whatever your schemes of work are, you need that conclusion of your key stage three content, however you call it, whatever you call it, you've concluded it and your, your language with the students is changing, your approach with the students is changing and what you're doing, you're up in the, the resilience and independence. You want, to be, you want to be instilling that during year nine. Familiarisation, and I say through the teaching, but of the GCSE papers, you don't want to be keep talking about GCSE and using GCSE papers as all your resources, but you want to use the opportunity in year nine that the little things that we've talked about on previous sessions, myself and Mal, where we talked about the differences between exam boards and and we, we support schools who are onboarding, coming from another exam board to, to Pearson. It is significant, not just through the teaching and the understanding of what the exams are like but for the, through the kids eyes they need to know and be prepared for the font the lines the the way the marks are allocated and you start building that familiarization during year nine and what i've put as my curriculum content statement is i want the students smooth transition from primary school to us as best as i possibly can but more importantly from key stage three to key stage four and that's year nine um, it's that transition to be mature in year 10, more mature than they have been before. Ensure scientific calculators, and I've put year nine-ish, because moving to a new school in January last year, so I've been there a year, there were scientific calculators for nine, ten, no, 10 and 11, and then normal, small, little calculators, cheaper ones, for seven, eights and nines. 
the first thing I wanted to get rid of was that I wanted the scientific calculator to be part and parcel from year seven onwards, ideally the same model. And I've put in there ideally because we're having a huge headache with that at the moment that the one that I want to push is very, very expensive. And I think it's unfair on the families to have to spend that kind of money. And there are other ones out there that are a bit cheaper, but then it does make it an absolute nightmare in class when they've all got different buttons for fractions, different buttons. So I say ideally. So this is where you do want to beg and plead to your SLT that you've got sets of calculators, even though you're requesting families to buy one, because it's always great to have a backup. We know that because those conversations with the same model is, is vital in assessments at home and in class. The first resource that we dip into, and we have started this as of January coming back for our year nines, is, is the one marker starters. In the Emporium, there's a suite of 16 starters, and you want to be dipping into those now, once a week, twice a week. They are all the one mark questions from all the foundation papers. We do need to update and add a couple more on to allocate in the summer and the November papers. So there'll be a couple more pages added. And year nine, getting to see in that format, all the one markers gradually over this period of time. That mm. for me was brilliant last year, starting in January at the school. My year nines had the suite working on those. And I've seen it now with those students in year 10, being very, very confident and knowing the language, seeing how the first questions are in those foundation papers. Even the students who went on to, or will, are on higher now or on the higher course, saw those. They're practicing the grams to kilograms, et cetera, et cetera. They are a brilliant resource and they're in the Emporium. Looking forward now to the end of year nine. So when you start doing a formal assessment, ideally in an exam location um, with strict exam conditions as well, we want foundation paper for all the students as their end of year. Now, I've said their foundation paper one, realistically, if you yeah. can get foundation paper one, two and three in there, even better. But it depends on what you can have for the end of year nine in whole conditions, etc. Yeah, and I think there's for some, it's a reluctance about when you show students the for their first to set, uh, GCSE and they, it covers content that they haven't been taught. Yeah, by all means, take out content they haven't been taught. But when you look at a GCSE, there will be very little in there that by the end of year nine, they will not have been taught if you've covered the national curriculum. Yes, it may not have been taught in year nine, but at the end of year 11, a GCSE is the culmination of 11 years of education, not just what they've been taught in, in year 11. But the one marker thing I've been doing with my year nines and, and selling them the, the, the idea that we get really good at this fluency stuff, that if on the first double page spread, we got 10 marks or eight marks, and then there's a two-way table or there's something else that I know they're going to nail, there's 20% of what we need for the grade four. So to start to use the language with them, but it's trying to be a little bit motivational with the group I've got. Yeah, I think going back to that point you said about the end of year, what you do with those assessments or how you do them, hit the nail on the head because I know it is a controversial topic or subject. And for me personally, I want them to see, and I'm trying to build in maturity and conversations around what the end game is. And this is at the end of year nine. This is literally the last yeah. couple of weeks before they start that GCSE. And I know some schools very much like to take out some questions, which I completely agree with as well what I want to instill in them that even those questions where they've not necessarily gone into the depth of what they are expected to they can probably still get one out of the four mark or one out of the three mark part of it and it's trying to get them to consistently not be afraid of of those questions but it's very much down to how I feel that if you instill that resilience early you have less yeah. issues when it comes to year 11 on where they're going to be placed for the tier in. So it's it's huge yeah. for decisions. It's about preempting it early, getting them prepared, because it is a long journey, but also showing them the road ahead and saying, this is, we, we, we've mapped it out for you. We're holding your hand. We're, we're going to be there by your side as we do this. And let's, let's just crack on and do it. Absolutely. If you get the chance to get any kind of assessment at the end and you go down this route, don't mark it feedback as normal. Do it a bit differently. Share the mark. Well, you can still mark it in feedback as normal, but show the students the mark schemes, print them off, show them, show the language of what the mark schemes look like, not just mm -hmm. the exam papers. And again, they come back into year 10, starting GCSE with that understanding of what it's about, 
rather than it being right here we go you they have a lot thrown at them in year 10 in every single subject let's be a bit preemptive over that summer period of actually this is what we're going to be doing when we get back to i know people always talk about especially your low attainers about it being demoralizing and all that kind of stuff it's how you sell it it's it, it does depend a bit about how you you your personality and your style as a teacher my students at the end of year nine will be going in there with a target of just don't get zero that's your target just don't get zero because it's, it's not life and death it's just we're just doing some sums and mm. it is literally trying to make it as low stakes as possible the outcome of how they perform on these papers can help you get students in the i'm not saying in the perfect route of two years of higher or two years of foundation but it can give you a very good idea particularly if you analyze and i'm not saying data and uh, qlas and all of that yet what i'm saying here is you're looking at the performance of how they've done are they coping yeah. with those crossover questions at the end are they mopping up and getting all those one markers? And like Mal said, plus a two-way table, plus a frequency tree. And they're getting significant marks on these papers, irrelevant of where their starting point was. How are they coping with these papers? And start thinking about getting the sets ready for year 10 based on these assessments. And I think this is yeah. something that us do anyway, but really use these papers to your benefit, not just an internal small assessment that you've probably done over the course of the year, or possibly end of topic tests, if you get the chance to do this, an amalgamation of GCSE questions like a GCSE paper, and it works for your setting, utilise the data that comes out from it. Yeah. Right, year 10 is, is where it starts to get ramped up. So a quick glance down there, you can see more highlighted um, resources to dip into the Emporium. But as bullet points, again, in terms of for going into a bit more detail, now, Mal talks about, and she's already said it in this uh, presentation, I don't think I've been in a presentation with her where she hasn't mentioned it. They've got a hill to climb. Mal talks about the closer you get. In fact, no, I'm not going to say You can say it. Yeah, our view has always been, if the if our, we've got to climb a mountain, i.e. the GCSE with our year 11, is the, and I will draw an analogy, I'll draw a little mountain and I'll draw a road to it. And this road has got three stopping points. And from each point, we decide to go up it. And I just say to them that if I show you the end result back in year nine and the start of year 10, it's a nice steady climb rather than showing it to you in year 11 when it's like it's a really steep climb. And that's when the nerves and the anxiety start to kick in. So this is about saying we're going to take the nice steady, we're going to leisurely stroll. I'm not running up a steep hill. And just the more prep we can do in year nine and 10, the less tiering decisions. I think that's the crux if pe about the, the whole tiering is it's a three-year plan or has been a three-year plan for us. There is stuff that will that can be done for those knee-jerk decisions, but it's about preparing them early. So at the end of year nine, they've done that assessment. You've put your spin on it. You've looked at it. You've got your, let's assume you've got your set sorted. They come back in year 10, get a baseline assessment early in year 10. In the class, um, either one, a paper one foundation or paper one higher. Bearing in mind that you've probably tried to get, and I, I'm a firm believer of this, as many onto higher as possible. Not for any game playing, not because I think any tier is easier than the other, but because I want high aspirations for every single kid. I talk about transit. Yeah, absolutely. And it's that it's about those high aspirations. It's about teaching a high expectations about we're going to teach as much of this content as we can to as many of the kids. Um, and we're not talking about just teaching in grammar schools or elite schools. We're talking about state comprehensive, state high schools, where we're talking about normal kinds of cohorts. But having those, of course, you're going to go on the higher tier. Why wouldn't you? And it's almost because I want them to be better at maths than me. I want them to have high grade boundaries because that means people are getting better. It's um, it is a, it's a long old journey, but it's been worth it because I'm, I'm looking at a, a set three in your current year eleven where I came in and it was yeah let's do the higher and the eight of the thirty kids in the group only two have moved to foundation and they raised their game to talk about what do I need to do to stay on the higher because I want to know more maths. 
I think you summed it up, Mel, about three slides ago. It's about how you sell it to the students. And I'm, yeah. I'm not talking about here silly decisions. I'm talking about when you've got under the skin of these students, you know what they're capable of, you've seen it, you've heard it, you've felt it, you've sold them this idea. And this is purely down to I want more people to do better, higher, I want yeah. more level students going on for our school. That's it. But once you've yeah. got that idea sorted, you get that baseline in place the baseline is to again it's to start that mountain it's to give them that that point of no return you're not going lower than this ever and it's over the course of year 10 what I found works very very nice and I know some people or some schools will do this in other year groups anyway but in year 10 their baseline assessment is paper one their follow-up assessment whenever you get around to doing the next assessments based on your data input etc cetera, etc cetera, would be paper two paper three follows that and if you're lucky, you might then end up with end of year exams for year 10, where you can do a whole other suite, another three papers. So I like three papers split over the, uh, not the early part of year 10, but um, we would have one in as a baseline, probably one before or just after Christmas, and then one in or around Easter for their three papers over the course of the year, which enables me to data input, but more importantly, finish suites of papers off with these students bit naughty possibly i don't know but my students that see the higher paper i don't chop off the topic areas they haven't seen but i tell them there's going to be topic areas they haven't seen because i want to see them have a go because no doubt there's going to be at the end of year 11 questions in a format they, they, they don't they're not familiar with yeah and I want to instill that having a go that's what it's about it's not about being horrible and putting questions in front of them that they haven't been taught it's about I want to see what your thought process is and the amount of conversations when you follow up and go through those papers in class actually well done random name Timmy no one's called Timmy anymore, but well done, Timmy. I could see that you were starting to think of highest common factors with that question, which would lead you onto eventually the right the right lines. So that's the reason yeah. I don't, yeah. but I'm a firm believer of supporting those schools that do decide to do it and take it off because, again, the context that they're in. But I, I really sell it to the students that it doesn't matter. Like Mal said, just don't get zero. So those yeah. three papers are over the course of the early part of the year and at each point it gives you an opportunity to relook at the sets as well any surprises good or bad if you are looking at the reordered papers which are on the emporium and what they've done is purely looked at the success of each question and reordered the paper so if there's a misconception question like there was back in 2017 2018 i think it was actually m cubed had m cubed and loads of people put m to the power of six in fact, I think most of the cohort put M to the power of six. It means they're good at laws of indices, but not good at basic addition in algebra. That was done really, really badly. So when with the reorder of it, it was put right at the end. I would not let students see reordered papers. This is my personal, and I know Mal's personal opinion as well, in year 11. You want yeah. them to experience as it was as a sit-in. Gives you a justification against um, how that cohort did it um, when, when it was a real exam. But also, there are these ups and downs and swerves and stuff in these papers. Think, so. Yeah, and I think part of what the theme, <laughs> the underlying thing I'm picking up for us having this conversation, Seeger, is that it's about normalising the pressure and the stress that kids will undergo with an exam or, or an exam series, because it is normal. The feelings, and it's about saying these feelings are normal. There's a girl that normal. we always mention. Me and me and Mal, when we started at our second school. Anna. No, well, she's the success story, but she wasn't yeah. the one that was head down, refusing to have a go at the paper. And, okay. and this was in year 11, not because of anything other than it wasn't normalised building up to that point. To roll on two years, roll on three years. We had none of those students. It's only when we've gone into a school in the early part and inheriting students and I'm not saying it's me and Mal brilliant, we know how to do it. I'm just saying we oh, no. yeah, we completely normalise the language, the pressure, who cares? Come on, we're not we're not trying to do anything other than answer some sums. Yeah. And uh, exactly the same happened at this school. I'm sure exactly the same is happening for you right now at your new school. Mal started in January, uh, September, sorry, as well. So yeah. So you completed the three the three papers over the course of that year. If you want to, you can utilise it to put it together, to look at the grade boundaries, 
that's a whole other conversation to get again we like to up any kind of grade boundaries to one give us a buffer because you never know what's coming up on the next sitting but also always have a very high bar keeping that bar high higher or foundation keeping the bar nice and high the end of year assessments let's assume again now that you get the three full papers i know i didn't last year but i am this year paper one from a suite of and I know some schools go, right, we're going to have to, to fool some of the students so they don't go off and Google answers. They have paper one from 2018, paper two from 2019, paper three from 2020. No, you wouldn't have it from 2020 because there was no exam. But what I'm saying there is that we, we really want them to have what the suite was when it was sat as a real exam. So all three, ideally, from a sit-in. So I'm using at the moment November 2022 papers. Paper one was as is, paper one. So the students go in, see paper one. Any of those clever um, little sausages that go off and find a question, Google it and get prepared ready for paper two, when they sit down for paper two, it's actually paper three from that sitting. Then if any of them go off and think, I'm going to go and find paper two, because they've definitely not done paper two, so it's the one I went and practised a minute ago, or, or last night anyway, we use a shadow paper of paper two for their paper three. And the shadow papers, again, a resource on the Emporium, exactly the same, but with the questions changed. It just takes out that worry, have they gone off and found these questions? And if they've managed to go off and find the questions and work out how to do them all ready for a shadow paper, brilliant. It's worked anyway. Revision has worked. But do ensure the same sitting, for my personal opinion, on this, this package idea of the papers, but it keeps the element of surprise and you can still get your rough grades can be allocated based off the grade boundaries and you can utilize data behind the scenes it's just something that's worked hasn't it mal thinking about those three papers yeah that, that yeah because you've got to think about the, the makeup of the papers and the assessment objectives the content coverage so yeah it has worked really well for us yeah yeah, some people go, oh, we're just going to have 50 mark papers or we're just going to use the one paper. I find it really difficult to get a full picture of what that student's capable of. Not even for data or input, is it? You just don't get a no. good sense no. of. And my big, biggest issue moving to this new school and sit, and starting from January, I've never done it before, starting in, I've never done it before. I've only moved, been in four schools in all my career, but the January starts and getting to know kids at that point onwards what really helped me this year is looking back at what they got in their mocks, what they went on to get, and then being able to have this picture of what students can do in a period of time. I'm not sure I could get that from doing a 50 mark paper at one point, then moving on to a full paper at another point, because it's a different experience for the child every time. You want, you want that normalisation all the way through. Just in terms of that reset, in the idea being that we've the set ones and set twos are almost sorted. Our set threes, we've sold them the dream that we're moving to higher. Again, this is just to give you an overview of the, the what's got underpinning all of this. And then we have then anybody else that's got a shot at it. And by that, I mean, for us, it has been everybody else that's left because we've never had a nurture group because we've never needed to because we've just taken in everybody else. Again, it's about having those high expectations. That's what we mean by resetting, making sure that we've got the right teachers with the right groups, those that have got those higher, those students that are doing almost lower, higher stuff. They're focusing on the right topics. So the AO1, using and applying stuff, the process-driven stuff, um, initially to gain success that gives them confidence that then they can go on and have a bit more of the deeper understanding stuff. Um, but it's about getting students onto this cycle of success, gives them confidence, that gives them more success, that gives them more confidence, and it's an upward spiral. Students that go on to the higher, no matter when it is here, no matter what they find it difficult, they find it challenging, and it is like seeing foundation for the first time. It's just about getting repetition, I suppose. Yeah. If you have any intervention, I know Mal's just started some tutor groups intervention, whereas um, I, because of starting in January last year, I was able to beg and plead to get them started in September. So if you can get tutor groups or intervention packages ready, um, and that can be based on what data you've got from these papers as well. So like Mal just said, then the higher, the upper higher, the lower higher, the upper foundation, lower foundation you can have 
a bit of a suite of intervention ready by the end of year 10. I don't mean you've got all the resources planned. I mean, you've got a bit of an idea on how to support certain students. And it doesn't have to be fancy. Just do more maths, literally, because that's what we need to do. We need to build in this automaticity, if that's even the way you pronounce it, for kids to have the practice. And just sometimes, it, so my questions have always been those one mark questions, um, and then a wordy question that we'll discuss and talk around and because some of the research about how we get better students better at problem solving is the worked examples, it's the modelling, it's them then having a go. So, again, nothing fancy. Mm. Provide, get ramp up your communication with parents at this point as yes. well. I Massive. That it is, isn't it? I think this is the point where you can really get the parents on board with what Year 11 is all about and... I sent it from a very personal point to my, our current year 11s at the end of year 10 on the back of my own son going through it and seeing it for 20 years as a teacher and the pushing that I've done as a teacher was very much humbled and rumbled and and really shown actually year 11 is very, very tough. And it was a very personal email from my own personal point of view that actually it's going to be a tough year next year, but let's start working together from this point onwards anything you can dip into over the summer and provide some practice set papers, steam papers, bronze, silver, gold papers, whatever it is, dip into the Emporium. There's a, a wealth of things there that can support you, but start your conversations with parents then. And I know you do the same mail at that point. Yeah. So already set up mailing list of email parents from the end of year 10 saying this is how they performed because very, I find that students are really interested in, especially as they go into the GCSE years, the actual content that they do and don't know and students will want to hide the fact that they still don't know how to do division or they don't know that a thousand millilitres is a litre because their parents would be quite disappointed that they don't know that and it's not that they don't know it it's in there somewhere so students don't like sharing specific information and those of you that got kids when we're teenage kids when was the last time you went into their bag and look at their books when it's when they're in primary school you do it all the time so I like to share question level analysis, just a rag sheet. Here's the analysis, the performance from end of year 10. Gets really well received by parents. But also means I've got my mailing list set up, ready for as we go into year 11. And talking about year 11, this is year 11 to start with on the back of them going through the route that we've got there on the timeline. So we'll do that first and then we'll look at um, the final ideas or the, the, the knee-jerk uh, conversations that happen. So the going go in early with the baseline. A baseline assessment of, again, a 1F or 1H. At this point, you want your ideal foundation higher split. I would probably say this is your last call for anyone to start the higher. And I'll put start in inverted commas there. It's starting the route to do the higher paper intervention starts asap after school half term revisions saturday schools whatever it is you do start it early try and get that slot after school that is regular for you in maths that the students buy into early there's nothing worse than it being watered down over the course let's say not over the course but starting late when everyone else is thinking about it you need to be a nice one of those ones that's available early. And, and again, planting the seeding with the students. This It's the norm to do this. And then when it gets to the end, they're in a routine. They've been coming to you every Thursday after school anyway. Tutor time maths is kicking off. The aiming for papers are my personal favourites at the moment. They're in the Emporium again. Aiming for a grade three, aiming for a grade four. Those papers are there with a mark scheme, but with a suggested grade boundary. And the suggested grade boundary comes from the success of those questions in that little booklet and the average grade four, what they came out with on those questions. So, for example, the aiming for a grade three paper was brilliant for my tutor, time maths, even with all of my high flyers. And I was able to say the average grade four students on these questions got 19 out of 31. The average grade five student that came out last year, 24 out of 31. And it was a real challenge and it was setting up a challenge for these students, knowing what mark they've got to try and get to on those questions. Brilliant conversations. It's under no pressure as well within the tutor group time. And again, like Mal said just before she went, 
it's more maths, but it's more maths with a little bit of a focus and also sharing real good stats with those students. 19 marks, you're not allowed to drop any marks. Where are you gonna drop the marks? Which marks are you gonna to choose to drop before starting the paper? Those kind of things to make sure they can get to those 19 or 24 marks or whatever it is you want to try and get. A couple of my high flyers did get 30 out of 31 out of 31, which was great as well. Introduce early and over the course of year 11, the foundation paper challenges. You can do these in earlier on as well. What I like these for, um, and again, whether it's after school sessions or when you've got a drop down or if you're given cover and you've got year 11 in front of you and you don't want to do the cover work that's been set. Foundation paper challenge is where you get all the students sitting in front of you under no pressure to have a competition to see how far they can get through the paper. You'll never get through the paper in the course of one lesson anyway, so you can keep them back to finish off or homeworks or whatever. But you're constantly practicing the early questions. You don't have time with all the teaching to go back over the height of a man versus the height of a tree kind of question or labeling a bar chart or drawing a bar chart. This enables you to revise it in a low stakes environment, but also in a competitive environment where they're they're just trying to get marks. They're trying to get through these questions in a different way. And I really do build in, I love the foundation paper challenges and I build them in all the way over year 11 for my higher tier students as well. I wouldn't say my top performing ones that have got to go on to try and get those seven, eights, nines, but like Mel said, those lower, higher students, but it also builds in preparation for if you do have to make any movements across to the foundation paper for their end of year exam, because that is a very tough call Students that have been prepared for higher, they've been taught higher content and they're not quite making the grade and you're worried about them and they're, they're going to do better on that foundation. You're worried about the content they've missed for foundation. It constantly hangs over you all the way through until August. But if you have built in time for the foundation paper challenges for those type of students, they've always been seeing over the course of year 10 maybe and definitely year 11, the foundation questions that you know you wouldn't have covered with them in any other format. Full set of mocks, some schools do two sets, um, some schools just do the one, um, whether it's in or around Christmas, before or after Christmas, and that really is your last call for anyone starting foundation um, at that point, because you want to see them in that in that format of doing the three papers. It may be that there is it's the last call after they've done that uh, mock, but realistically, you do need a second mock or some kind of assessment to see how they are succeeding once you've moved them to the foundation. So in, in year 11, um, my gut feeling and my history of teaching, again, the case study, the start of year 11, anyone starting higher, this is the last chance. And anyone starting foundation that's moving from higher would be around the mocks, probably January time around now is really that last call. Final countdown and strong parent communication is established, it's not started. And what we send out every single Friday is a selection of questions that we've made called the final countdown, which cover crossover and higher. And we've done some work in towards as well for our students that just need to get over that line into the grades ones, the grade twos, selection of questions with mark scheme that we ping home every Friday. And it gives them a direction to work on whether they've got tutors, parents that will sit with them and do the work. I don't request any of them to be sent back to school to mark. This is purely guidance for at home. And then again, ideally three papers for that second set of mocks. You may have to do some in-house. I'm a firm believer that you do need to sit in the hall at that point and being so close to the real exam, making sure that they can cope with extra time, scribes, readers and all of that stuff so you don't have any issues in the format in the summer. So I am a big believer of a second set of mocks, even if it's just in core exams, which probably is time wise the right decision because you want to get through a lot of content as well still. But maths, if you can get in three, four papers in exam conditions, um, end of Feb, early March. Highlighted up there, exam aid training over the course of year 11 for this year as well. Don't throw them blind a exam aid. Um, the formula sheet, make sure they know what they look like. You talk through them. Uh, we've got a little presentation that we've put together. And if anyone wants to see it, see it let, let us know that just says it's called tickle trash. 
you can edit that presentation as you see fit and it, you have a conversation with the students actually this is a, a trash one we don't do it this way you've all learned soccer toa spout this way so we're going to practice that right now that you're familiar with how soccer toa looks on the formula sheet compared to how you've learned it in lessons tick we we use um, circumference is 2 pi r which is how it is on the formula sheet and we use pi times diameter again it's just a conversation so they are they're familiar with that exam aid for this year 11. Conscious of time so I'm going to rattle through these last minute conversations and last minute things that build up over the course of year 11 or even just shock you and surprise you at this point in year 11. It may be down to many factors building up to this point you've got hopefully success so you should have the success stories of right yes you're going to be going into these tiers you may have a turn of events in terms of bad behavior bad attitude but staffing issues i know uh, several schools that have lost many many staff from year 10 into 11 which has knee jerked and changed a lot of these decisions but then students that have turned into kevin and perry overnight and for those younger members of the audience uh, you might have to google kevin and perry but attendance and everything else that has changed who they are coming into year 11, sometimes for the worst, sometimes for the best. So there's lots of things that go into the mix to make your last minute decisions a bit of a nightmare. Your scores on those early year 11 mocks really start those last minute tiering decision conversations, whether it was with parents, SLT, your department or the student themselves. Your foundation paper challenges now. If you've got any one that you are concerned about on the higher, build it into a lesson in the low stakes. Let's go for it. Let's see how you can do. And it will aid that movement or the conversations that you're having with the students and the members of the department. Now, whether you want to move some students from higher to foundation, don't overdo it. I would build in one every, depends on how worried you are about certain students, but I wouldn't do one any more than a half term anyway, but there might be, you might ramp it up a couple, depending on how many lessons that you have, and you want to see how these students can perform on that foundation paper, but also cover your back that they've seen the early questions. Ensure the crossover content is being covered up by all the students. Your very high ability students might be via the starters, those light, lower hires, the upper foundation that you want to get them right. You may be wanting to do your revision sessions after school, really concentrating on the crossover content. If anyone wants a copy of the crossover revision guide that myself and Mal have got published, I'll send you one free in the post. Just drop me an, an address in an email, I'll get it out to you. You can utilize that. The aiming for papers build into any interventions you can because that aiming for a grade three paper gives you a very, very good idea on the foundation type of questions with a great, a rough grade boundary of how an average grade four student did. Use them now. They are brilliant. Like I've said, my tutor group are using them now. Good parental conversations on what you want to cover from this point onwards. You are going to have students right down to the wire at Easter. But if you're having good communication, and we are, I know that one of them has is, is actually got a tutor and I've never promoted a tutor, but if I know they are, I can direct the work that is being done at home. If there is no good parental communication, they're not interacting with you. It's down to what you do from the point they arrive at school to the point they leave. If factors like attendance are being taken out of your hands for certain students, your hands are tied. You need to go with what they're comfortable with and what you know they can do from your last snapshot of when they did a full paper. And I've got one very much like that whose attendance is very, very poor. Realistically should be on the higher, but I, ha I cannot physically get enough evidence and enough teaching time to get them on that higher. So they are doing the foundation, but with me, as soon as they're in, working through the aiming for papers and very much doing the foundation paper challenges when I see him. But the journey from early 11 mocks up and up to our second set um, with those ideas of intervention, I call it intervention, it's not intervention, it's just support with different ways can help you set up those final tier and changes. Anyone wants to delve in more into particular ideas or particular things, please get in touch. We're, we're happy to jump on a Zoom conversation with you or a telephone conversation or anything that you want to just get off your chest and go, I've got a couple of students here, just email us.
we will sit and talk about the conversations we've had because I guarantee between myself and Mal with the different schools we've been to we would have had the same scenario that you are facing at some point. I've got it circled there I am not going to go through these slides this is for another day and I know we will put a session on looking at scripts view and results plus but build a thought process in to use the results from this summer with your year 11s to help you get ready to not have the same issues as you will next year for more students you're still going to have attendance behavior attitude and things like that thrown in the way but if you can utilize scripture and results plus over the summer preparing um, and early in year 11 next year i promise it really will help settle everything down another notch in terms of those tiering decisions and there's several slides there that you'll get these that you may want Neil Mouse just to go through in a bit more detail, or we will run, and I'm sure Seb will back me up here, a session um, reminding guys about Results Plus and Script Viewer, probably after the GCSE exams, when it's when it's there on your radar a little bit more rather than intervention, teaching maths, what we've got to get done, let's get these guys ready for an exam. Um, apologies, um, I haven't been able to keep on top of the chat as I've been rabbling on constantly for an hour, so hopefully Seb's answered those questions or he'll pass on to me anything that's come come through but um, essentially um, it's a three-year plan um, where it will become much more clearer every year once that plan's in place and then it's down to the few hopefully not to uh, not to the many.